The bugs are coming. It's pocket wine school. <laughs> Right now we're talking about the great killing phylloxera insect, where it came from, how it caused so much damage, and why it's so freaking hard to stop it. So ready for some bug apocalypse? Fantastic. In the 19th century, England was fascinated by the latest craze, botany. Now, why in the world would the study of plants be the subject of such fervor? Well, it was cheap, it was simple, and Minecraft had not yet been invented. Maybe even more than that, the move from an agrarian economy to a rapidly industrial, factory-driven economy made people long for a simpler, more natural time. Also, flowers are super pretty. So what's the problem with this? Well, now that England and America had mostly worked out their daddy issues, more and more British scientists found themselves wandering over to the former colonies to scope out the lush foliage that grew like weeds and often were weeds. And since human beings have been all about drunkening agents since time immemorial, it was only natural that those Brits would want to sneak back a few American grapevines, you know, for sciencey purposes. Now, do you remember that time you hooked up with that one person and you asked them if they had crabs and they said, no, I don't have crabs. And then a week later you found out that they'd given you crabs, even though they swore to God that they didn't have crabs. Well, in a sense, America had crabs and didn't even know it. Those crabs were actually more like aphids and they were called phylloxera. Phylloxera are vicious little bugs, no matter how cool and laid back they pretend to be. They attack the grapevine leaves and much more importantly, the roots by biting into them to get to that sweet, sweet sap. What's so dangerous about this is that their spit is basically liquid poison, which causes the root to get all scabby and warped until eventually the root can't take up any water or nutrients and the vine dies. Without vines, there are no grapes. Without grapes, there is no wine. And without wine, this YouTube channel would be nothing but me staring into a camera wondering what went wrong with my life. Our British botanist buddies discovered that they picked up the nasty phylloxera bug once their vineyards started dying off. Didn't know that there were vineyards in England? Heck yeah, there are. And in the 1850s, they were dying off. And if you're thinking, well, it's only English wine, who cares? Well, guess what England's right next to? Ireland, but also France. And in the late 1850s, vines in France's Southern Rhone started falling apart. This was bad news because just like how you passed your crabs onto nearly everyone in your swingers group, Phylloxera immediately began traveling from vineyard to vineyard, killing everything in its path on its way to finding Sarah Connor. Historically, Europeans have been kind of all about wine. So, crisis. Grape growers tried everything. After all, they dealt with bugs before. Surely there was something that would kill them off, right? Not so fast, Phylloxera have an exceedingly complex life cycle. Human beings have a relatively simple life cycle. There's childhood, there's the period where you're all about golf, and then there's the golden girls. Phylloxera have up to 18 life cycles and can reproduce during any one of them. It's sort of like the Hydra. Cut off one head and you make things that much harder for Captain America. So the grape growers got desperate. One early attempt at combating the pest was to, and this is true, bury a still-breathing toad under the vine in order to suck out the poison because that's totally how toads work. Except, good God, no. Thankfully, more scientific heads prevailed, and they were on the job. Three in particular. One French, one American that used to be British, and another American that used to be also American. In France, there was Jules-Emile Planchon, a botanist from southern France. In America, there was an ex-British entomologist named Charles Valentine Riley. And then in Texas, which is part of America for now, there was an avid grapevine collector named Thomas Volney, or T.V. Munson. Each of them made discoveries that led to the building of the great defense against phylloxera. Charles Riley discovered that several Native American grapevines were mostly or even totally immune to phylloxera. Since these vines had been around phylloxera for much longer, they'd evolved to produce a kind of sap that was much stickier. It clogged the mouth of the bugs that tried to eat it. Moreover, the sap actually had some properties that helped heal the wounds left by the bug bites. So maybe the world could just start growing American grapes. No dice, said Europe. Your grapes smell like a fox peed on them. Never mind that in the 1990s, people would suddenly and bafflingly start referring to the smell of cat pee in certain grapes like it was a good thing. 
Instead, 19th century Europe said, we need our Cabernet Sauvignon, our Merlot, our Grenache, and our Chardonnay. What else you got? For a time, they tried making hybrids of European grapevines and American grapevines, only to discover that the resultant grapes were still too fox PE for good winemaking. This is where Planchon came in. He pioneered the move to graft or transplant European grapevines called Vitis vinifera onto American rootstocks, hoping against hope that it wouldn't affect the taste of the wine. Fortunately, it turned out that the gene that controls grape development is located in the top part of the vine, not the rootstock. Back in America, our grapevine collecting buddy T.V. Munson suggested that the best American rootstocks to graft were Vitis rupestris and Vitis riparia. Not only would it fight against phylloxera, but you could also choose rootstocks that were suitable for certain soils or even climates. Thus was born the modern grape growing industry. But hold on, was phylloxera everywhere? After all, it's a bug that has certain preferences. Like Anakin Skywalker, it hates sand. So vineyards on sandy soil seemed mostly immune. Moreover, the reason why phylloxera spread so rapidly was that in humid climates, the bugs suddenly and horribly grow wings. In dry climates, they don't. So hot, dry climates were able to put up the good fight. Historically, the regions that dodged the great phylloxera bullet were Chile, Washington State, and big chunks of Australia. But nowhere is totally safe. And even doing your grafting isn't flaw-free. For instance, in the late 20th century, God, it makes me feel old saying that. California thought it was totally bug-free but it was using a cheaper and different rootstock called AXR1, named, I believe, after someone's grandmother, that wasn't totally resistant to phylloxera. And this was like what happens when you don't take your entire course of antibiotics, thinking, I feel better, it's probably gonna be fine. Phylloxera was only partially put off by this weaker rootstock and did what phylloxera does best, mutate and become stronger, Wolverine style. And guess who had to rip all their vines up? Now, I know what you're saying, Tommy, I love it when they spray my vines down with chemicals. Surely there's some kind of chemical intervention, right? Well, sort of. There's an insecticide called spirotetramat that does a pretty good job at getting rid of the kind of phylloxera that chews on leaves. And leaf phylloxera is pretty gross. The underside of the leaf gets covered with this nasty wart looking alien egg sac made of poison saliva. These are called leaf galls and spirotetramat can stop this from happening. Problem is, spirotetramat does nothing to stop root damage, and that's the more important thing to fight. Grafting remains the most effective defense against phylloxera. Now, is this all a mighty screed against the dangers of globalization? No, it's not. But it's a plea to be thankful for what we have and how it was almost completely destroyed, and how it was saved by the hard work and diligence of scientists. Except those dudes who planted live toads underground. That literally will keep me up at night.